All right, I am going to uh, start the recording. Bear with me in a minute as it uh, winds up. All right, the recording is started, so let's call the meeting to order at 6.01. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Hearing none, is there any public comment? Hi, Linda. All right. Hearing none, let's let's move on to the meeting minutes. Uh, so I'd like to make my uh, typical motion, which is to approve the uh, Governing board meeting minutes uh, with edits from Alan, and those are the uh, <laughs> May 9th, 2023 meeting minutes. <laughs> Second. Happy to do my part. Seconded by Siobhan, and you know, those are the only kind of minutes I like, by the way. So that's just <laughs> fine, just fine with me. So, any discussion on the approval of the minutes? All right, hearing none. Are there any opposed to the motion? Any abstentions? All right, the motion passes. The minutes are approved. Thank you very much. Um, we have the auditor's report at 6.15, and I think as soon as they arrive, it would be good to let them do their thing. But in the meantime, uh, anyone opposed to moving through the agenda and moving through to the treasurer's report next while we're, while we're awaiting our uh, auditors to join? Ray, are you ready to do that, sir? Please do. So you may have seen the report that uh, uh, Lori Beth passed out earlier. I wanted to call your attention to a few things. One is that the uh, total bank account, we have $9.3 million in the bank. And we have uh, other assets totaling 3.6 million of which 2.8 represents um, materials and inventory. Um, down here in profit and lost, yeah, thirty thousand dollars. I believe this is the Plainfield uh, contribution for uh, Town Arpa um, expenses. We have several categories. One is administration. Total administration this month is eighty-seven thousand dollars, which is made up of things like accounting, administrative services, insurance, um, office expenses. Um, the stipends for the officers, as well as the, as well as the payments for the employees, including uh, mileage, et cetera, et cetera, and so that's eighty-seven thousand dollars for administration. Uh, we have construction. You see here eighty eighty-four thousand uh, dollars, and those are billings by uh, Eustis Miner, uh, Materials of one point three million dollars. Uh, and then you have warehouse operations, including the management of 28,000 rent, $6,000 a month, and utilities $532 for a total of construction of $1.4 million. And then we have pre-construction and total pre-construction is about $350,000 made up of design services, make ready services and construction management, project management and outside plant um, expenses. So total expenses for the month of $1.8 million uh, for profit and loss. Happy to answer any questions. Next is expenses by vendor. And this is always kind of interesting. Here's that uses cable of 84,000. KGP Logistics, uh, they're one of our, our material providers of $1.3 million. NRTC Broadband, this is, represents 200, almost $300,000 in design. Uh, services from them. And here is that uh, Wild Blue Yonder warehousing uh, expense uh, mentioned mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, questions or comments? If not, thank you. And we still don't have an auditor. Uh, well, I'm, I'm checking now to uh, to see our list of folks that are here. Um, no, our auditor is not here yet. I did say 6.15, so I wasn't wasn't sure. I didn't want them waiting for us. I'd rather have us waiting for them. We have other 
other items that we can walk through. We can talk about a financial and grant support update. This is just an update, so, so there's no action necessary here. Uh, Ray, you want to continue? You're on a roll. Yeah. So um, you may recall we've discussed in the past about the grant gap. So that is the gap that's between the ARPA funds of about $23 million we've received uh, from the Vermont Community Broadband Board. And when the, ban the BEAD grants uh, become available and available to us, <clears throat> we, there's speculation about when the BEAD grants are going to hit and what uh, what money that we might be eligible for. Unlike the ARPA grants, we're not entitled to 9.37% of the total money for ARPA grants. We have to compete for those grants. For others in, in a particular region, those regions have not yet been defined. And so that's what the Community Broadband Board is also gonna do. In any event, because of this grant gap, uh, we wanna make sure we can still continue with construction into 2024. And so the executive committee has approved the engagement of NRTC and PFM to assist us going after grants and loans. Uh, and these are these would be uh, USDA Re reconnect grants, uh, USDA reconnect loans, as well as uh, PFM for debt assistance. And so this is a this is an update on those efforts. Uh, the other thing I'd mention to you is that. We will not, uh, the executive committee will not, the CB Fiber will not execute any long-term debt without the board's approval. Uh, Short-term debt, like a year or less, um, yes, the executive committee can do under, under the charter that the governing board has approved, but long-term debt is, um, is in your hands. And so uh, all this preparatory work will wind up coming back to you and with an update and perhaps where needed uh, for loans and debt um, uh, your authority to proceed. Any any questions on that? The, 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 there is one thing I would like to add. Um, Janiel and I were on the phone today with the VCBB this morning, walking them through our um, our request for grant disbursement and. We, we had to get our request in before the last week. We had to get it in, so it was in the queue. We got it in, it's in the queue. They're overwhelmed, and we, we just did a phone call, a, a Zoom meeting, a Teams meeting, to walk through our request so that they understood the supporting information that we gave them. And uh, it, all, it all worked out just fine. They understand the supporting information and our the the amendment was for approximately 1.9 million, and we asked for approximately 1.45. The half million that is that we didn't ask for is still CV Fiber funds. It's going to stay with the VCBB, and that money is the administrative money for keeping the lights on in 2024. Should there be zero grant money coming in. So that that that's our that's our stash for 2024. It's with the VCBB. It's ours, but they haven't we haven't asked for it yet, and they're holding it for us. But otherwise, we should get uh, 1.45 million hitting our bank account in in the next couple of weeks, and that'll be for the amendment to our construction grant. Janil, you want to add anything to that phone call this morning? It seemed pretty seemed to go pretty well to me. Like she said, um, it was in the queue and where it, we just had to provide some um, some explanations of how we arrived at our numbers and she just took notes and it, it seemed very straightforward. Okay, excellent. Um, I noticed that somebody just joined us with a, a, a Rhode Island uh, phone number uh, similar to Vermont, hey, one, one area code does the whole state. Who's that from Rhode Island? Hey there, it's Jerry. It's uh, Tim Sullivan, uh, Roxbury delegate. Hey Tim, welcome, welcome. We we're we're waiting for our auditor to appear, and I never know what phone number is going to come up. Yes, um, right, right. I was but, driving, so I had to connect this way. No, excellent, ex excellent. Thank you. Yeah, please don't crash. <laughs> yeah, really. Oh, too late now. <laughs> okay. 
So it's 610. Our auditor is scheduled to be here at 615. Um, our, our next item, services, fees, and affordability. Um, wh why, don't, why don't we move into that? Um, I'll take the affordability part because it's purely an, an, a notification and update for the board. I just want to make sure that the board understands that we are still pursuing affordability as a goal, and we have been in contact with uh, with uh, EAB, the uh, the uh, equity equity and affordability for broadband organization, right? And we've uh, we've we've received a proposal from them that we're looking at, we're evaluating, but it is certainly our intention, if it works out appropriately, uh, to work with them. And we 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 strongly believe in making our services as affordable as possible. It's a very difficult thing to do. We really appreciate the EAB existing as an organization, and we will bring to the board or bring to the governing board as appropriate when the time comes uh, a motion to to uh, uh, buy their services, if you will, to to chip into the pot for for the affordability. And at the same time, of course, we're always looking at the federal affordability program that we would do basically through Waitsfield uh, Telecom and those two are not mutually exclusive. We can combine those two for for a fifty dollar reduction to the subscriber uh, for for our services. So we're really looking forward to doing that. Uh, but that said, um, I'd like to turn over the services and and fees aspect of this. Janelle, you want to get it started? Um, sure. So we are. We're looking to approve, uh, the executive committee already did approve um, add-ons for our services. And that um, that includes a tower for Wi-Fi everywhere and uh, potentially um, would include phone hookup fees and w potentially wiring subject to uh, a site assessment um, it could also eventually include hardware, although we don't have anything on on for hardware at this time. Um, the executive committee did approve these uh, or make recommendation to approve these add-ons. Um, and then the other piece is a commercial a commercial rate uh, that we that we haven't had approved yet, but we are we are going to be offering commercial services as well as residential. And um, Ray, have you have you motions for this, or or would you would you like me to take that on? No, if, uh, I'm happy to take it from here. You may recall that at a previous governing board meeting that the governing board approved uh, uh, service tier rates for residential service that had been recommended by the executive committee. At that time, the governing board and the executive committee had not made a recommendation for commercial rates, and but now has a recommendation for commercial rates. And the executive committee is recommending that the governing board approve commercial rates for 1G and 2G service uh, at $179 and $259 respectively. And I have a motion uh, for that uh, exact um, and I will put that into the chat room. So that move the governing board approved commercial rates of $179 per month for service of one gig and $259 per month for service of two gigs. Second. Excellent. Seconded by Jeremy. Linda, I see you have your hand up. Let, let's uh, have a discussion. Yes. Phoebe Fiber paid Crawford, our marketing firm, to research commercial businesses in our districts. Crawford defined three personas addressing our commercial markets. The two, five, and 10 gigabyte internet packages are developed for these three business personas. We want to increase our revenues by upselling our commercial packages. Having two internet packages that overlap the residential packages 
will pull revenues from the top commercial packages. CV Fiber should have one gig and two gig residential packages, but start commercial packages at two gig, five gig, and 10 gig packages, having only one overlapping internet package with what is offered to residentials. So I, I would respond to that by by saying that anything that's over two gig is is basically a negotiated price, and we're we're also offering different opportunities for anyone that's asking for a commercial rate as opposed to what they're asking for a residential rate. So if you're if you're a resident and you're asking for a gig. You're not asking for the same level of service, even though it might be a gig, you're not asking for the other services that go along with that as commercial. But I will- I'd like uh, to make a friendly amendment. Go ahead, that we please. Drop, that we drop the one gig commercial service because I think it will de detract from getting higher level commercial business. Uh, Chuck, I see that your hand is up, sir. Go ahead. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes. I am the Verizon man. Uh, so uh, I have uh, a few thoughts on this I would just like to share with the broader board. Um, the first is uh, in the world of pricing, um, and I know we've already sort of hashed out residential pricing, and I don't want to necessarily relitigate it today, but in the world of pricing, the ending with nines is a very common tactic uh, for selling when you are trying to sell a lot of widgets because people believe, people inadvertently believe that it's slightly cheaper than, than the $1 cheaper it is by just having an even dollar amount. That said, uh, from, a, from a, a psychology perspective, um, there is growing evidence that if your business is establishing a long-term customer relationship rather than selling lots of widgets, it is better to use even pricing uh, because uh, it is seen as more trustworthy by consumers than prices that end with nine. Thought one. Thought two. Um, I actually will play a little bit of devil's advocate to Linda's uh, comment that, um, you know, I think there could be some businesses, and I'm thinking kind of like mom and pop, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, coffee shops, things like that, that, you know, are on a very limited budget and, and are spending most of their money on rent and are trying to make ends meet, um, that might get priced out if we start pricing bit commercial at two gig. Now we could make the argument that, hey, in that case, you maybe you just pick residential and call it a day. But the downside there is one is that's a conversation we may not have the luxury to have if they're exploring their options because they're not going to know that. And two, um, you know, the price being higher for the one gig resident uh, commercial over residential does mean we would still extract a little bit of additional ARPU out of that that price point for that commercial entity. But that actually leads me to my my third comment, which is more of a question to this broad group. What the heck are you getting for that much more per month? I, it is still totally unclear to me what uh, additional value you are getting as a customer for $60 a month, which is a lot of money. Uh, to answer that question, it's essentially um, that you're put to the front of the line for customer service. That's the benefit that you're getting. Ma Maggie, I see that your hand is up. Go ahead, please. So originally we were going to offer them more um, special features <laughs> than just getting put to the front of the line. And I think when you're looking at that big of a cost differential, that's really not a giant perk. If you think about going to the bank to drive through and you see the sign closest to the bank building that says commercial, a lot of the people going through that commercial line are still just the normal person who don't have commercial accounts because 
the drive-through lane was open. So they're just jumping right over there. And so that customer service person, if they're on the phone and then they are on the phone for 40 minutes with whomever it is, that that's going to happen. And I just don't think that we want to put everything on the line and say, you're always going to get answered first. You're always going to get prompt service and we're going to charge you X about more because of that. Um, I think we just need to be super careful with this because we're going to get some pretty quick customer service complaints with it. And I also, and I know we fought this battle and beat this horse dead, Chuck, but um, I am, from a marketing standpoint, 1,000% in agreement with Chuck about the 99 on prices. I think it makes us look very unprofessional. Okay. Uh, Jeremy, I see that your hand is up, and I also want to note that our auditor has joined us, so they will be they will be ready as soon as we're done with this. So what Thank do you, you got, Terry, Jeremy? I, I was actually going to suggest that we might want to table this so that we're not wasting our auditor's time. Well, hold on now. Let's let's that's a that's a specific term of art there, and I, well, I'm okay. not sure that Sorry. we want to use that term. Perhaps uh, pause it. But anyways, just um Pause. Or, or, just throwing it out there. Okay, who who seconded this? Ray I made did. the motion. Did we get a second? Yeah, I seconded it. I, I okay. think I made a friendly amendment, Jerry. And Linda made a friendly friendly amendment that said, "Let's let's only do the one gig for one seventy nine at this point in time." I thought it was two gig. No, it was like drop the one gig and only offer two, five, and ten on commercial. So, um, with all due respect, I don't accept that as a friendly amendment, and uh, we'll come back to the group later on with um, appropriate um, tier service prices for five and ten gig, which is what we intend to offer. Uh, but we, what what we were thinking of before was too low. So the motion is uh, still the same. I think the amendment should go to the floor. Linda, then you need to make a motion for the, for your amendment. I will make a motion uh, for my amendment. I think we should ask the, the floor if they want to put so much overlap between residentials and commercials and drop one gigabyte for commercial so that we get more commercials in the higher rankings okay Sweet. let's just let's just make sure we're clear here okay linda's making a motion has anyone seconded linda's motion so second so to be okay clear, so linda, chuck you're, you're mo just okay sorry Go so ahead, Jerry. so ray has rescinded his motion no i haven't no, you haven't it, it's 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 a motion to amend the motion. So now we're kind of nested in this second order motion, and we have to resolve this new motion, which could end up updating the raise motion, or it could not if this motion doesn't pass. That's right. And I wanted to be clear, Linda, your motion is to amend the previous motion to approve commercial rates only of $259 per month for two gig service. That that's looks like what Ray was offering, and I said just drop the one gig. That's right. Right. So okay. at this time, we're just looking at two gig for two fifty nine. Janiel, go ahead, please. I don't want to give my own opinion about this, but I do want to hear from our co community um, relationship manager, Maggie, um, as to what she thinks from a marketing perspective. Um, might make the most sense as between having two overlapping versus one overlapping. I am interested in knowing what she thinks about this. And I don't know the answer. So I think everybody should know the answer from our from our community relationship manager. Okay, Maggie, if you could please and 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 keep it to the item at hand here, please. The point made about the small um companies that don't won't know that using residential as an option is very true and as vermonters 
we are surrounded by a lot of small business owners. So I think that we need to think about them in making this decision. And um, that's, again, I think I'm going to go with Janiel here. Um, I think I've spoken my piece about how the pricing should be set up and <laughs> have been um, somewhat ignored. But um, as far as leaving the one and two, I think we need to think about think about our customers. Chuck, go ahead, sir. Um, I'm not an expert in Robert's rules, but I believe, Jerry, as chair, it is well within your right to put some a discussion that is currently in progress on the floor uh, and hit pause on it such that another order of business can be tackled and we can come back to it. So I think, I think, you, and you know, maybe Alan is here, but I think you're well within your right to say, hey, let's get back to this after the auditor gets the, to, to do their bit. Uh, th th that's, that's where I was going unless we were ready to close this out. And it doesn't quite seem that. like we're ready to close this out. Alan, sir, go ahead. Yeah, I think an interruption would be fine. And I mean, that's really what's happening here. We were waiting on somebody to appear. The person is here and we had started something that wasn't um, to be done at the at <laughs> at the time we were doing it, more or less. So I, I think Chuck is right, just for convenience and out of respect for the people who have now arrived to give a presentation. I think the fair and justifiable thing to do is just suspend the discussion we had before and just move on to the audit. Very good. I'm with you on that. Kelly, are you prepared to speak to us? And you, sure you are am. Just waiting on you. I know. This I, was interesting. I, I was. I was in it. I was riveted. I. I, I, I apologize. <laughs> we. Uh, you know. We had a couple of minutes. Things were going faster than we thought, and then they weren't. <laughs> hey, so. we, I serve on boards too. I know how these go. No problem. Okay. Go ahead, please, Kelly. I introduce sure. yourself. Will do. So I'm also here with my colleague, Kelly, but I'm Kelly DeMori, and I'm a partner here at the firm. I've been with the firm since 1999. I've, however many years that is a lot. Um, I head up our nonprofit division, and Kelly does a lot of work in the single audit space. So she was a, a good partner to have on this job, and we're looking forward to um, walking you through your very first audit and single audit, I suppose. Right, a lot going on today. So, Callie, go ahead. You can introduce yourself. Hi, yeah, I'm Callie. Um, I like Kelly said. I I do spend a lot of time in the nonprofit industry too, and single audits. Um, and I've been with the firm for about four years now. Great. And Callie did all the heavy list heavy lifting on this, so she'll have some commentary and some thoughts, but. If you want, we can jump right in. I know we have a limited amount of time, so we'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, what, what I thought, based on some preliminary conversations that we had um, with, with Ray and with Jerry, it just kind of orient you to the report. So we'll, we want to spend the time there. We also have a PowerPoint presentation, which we can send to you electronically to share with the group. That kind of go, it goes through our required communications and the things we're going to talk about, but a good thing to have on hand. So we won't spend time on that. We'll jump right into the financials, but you know, we do a lot of these. So if you have questions along the way, please interrupt us. We're happy to take questions as we go. Sound like a plan? Okay. Sounds great, Kelly. Thank you. All right. Good. So Callie, can you are you ready to drive this presentation? I think the, the you know the first thing to, you know, as we talked early on, um I think you were looking some some when we spoke with Ray and Jerry, like they were looking for something that said single audit, right? So I want to sort of talk about what the audits are that we perform. So first off, we need to go through what we consider to be a traditional or a financial statement audit to make sure your numbers are um, a properly stated so that we make the proper selections under your single audit or under uniform guidance. So the that single audit or under uniform guidance is really driven off of the grant funding or the pass through federal money that you receive as an entity. So if you are Spending. So again, it's not based on receipts, but expenditures. So if you expend more than $750,000 within your calendar year of this federal pass-through money, then it requires you to have this special audit. 
So under a financial statement audit, the more generic audit, we have certain thresholds and materiality that we can follow and a little bit more liberal guidance on what we do for the audit for audit purposes. Under the single audit, under the grant compliance audit that we're doing, that has much more stringent requirements. So when we get into some of the you know, findings from the report, some of them might feel a little nitpicky, but the, the way that the, this audit is laid out, it's very, very specific to these grants and it is very nitpicky. They wanna make sure that you have certain processes and procedures in place and that those are followed uh, very strictly. So, so what you'll see, this is all sort of combined into one financial. The beginning parts are more based off the, the financial statement audit. And then towards the end, we get into the um, single audit findings and things like that. So we'll kind of walk you through, I'm not gonna go through everything in the financials, but some of the important things um, we can go through and highlight. So if we go to, let's just flip through. So these are all sort of lead-in things that I think are pretty self-explanatory. This auditor's report is really the only thing that belongs to us in the financial statement. So if there are things within the financials you wanted to say differently, as long as they sort of fall under our uh, parameters, we're happy to do that. We're not English majors, right? We're, we're accounting finance people. So the words don't always align with what you want to say. So I would read that a little critically. Um, and then beyond this, so I, I will say that from a financial statement perspective, you have what we consider to be a clean opinion or an unmodified opinion on your financial statements. That means we didn't identify anything that would be considered um, that wouldn't allow us to form an opinion on these financials. So that that went very well. We'll talk about some of the recommendations that we have when we get towards the, the end of the financial statement. But this talks about your responsibilities, our responsibilities. It is important for you to read through. Um, and then we get to the management discussion and analysis. Now you guys are just starting out, right? You're pretty new, uh, don't have a lot of history to really get into this management discussion and analysis, but this is a great place for you to tell your story. Um, right now we've put in some things that we felt um, made sense here. You've added a little bit of commentary and some edits, but this is something that I expect would expand year after year as you as you have more, you know, miles lit under your belt and that more customers, you'd start to talk about some of those kind of things. But obviously, if there's things you wanted to add here, this is your document to add to. And then we get on to your balance sheet. So in the nonprofit world or the, the governmental accounting world, your statement of net position. So this is as of a point in time, so as of December 31st, and a couple of things I'll, I'll point out here. So you might think, okay, well, we we received all this grant money, right? $9 million or so, not, not quite, but eight and a half million. Um, you can see it sitting in the bank, right? It's in your cash balance there, 9.4 million. But you can also see down in the current liabilities, advance of revenues grants of 8.4 million. So that means you've received this money under the grant parameters, but you really haven't used it for the, the intended purpose. So it gets hung up on your balance sheet instead of being recognized as revenue yet. You also have some prepaid expenses and some deposits on material that you haven't placed in service yet under your current assets for 828,000. Those are current assets because we expect those are gonna be deployed within the next 12 months. Your capital assets, so this is gonna be the network that you're building. You have 5.6 million in process, so has not been completed and the depreciation process has not begun yet. So that is, still sitting there until that is complete. And then you, I skipped over this um, leased building. So we have new standards this year um, for to report any sort of long-term lease. And, and that is required to be capitalized on the balance sheet. In prior years, those, expen those would have just been expensed through the P&L. Through these new um, standards, we now have to value that, capitalize it as a right of use asset on your um, on your balance sheet with an offsetting liability, which you can see in the liability section. There's a current and long-term term piece. That will continue to be amortized over the course of the lease um, that you have in place. Fund net position, I'll just orient you to this. That's your 
um, equity in the for-profit world, right? So you have some of that equity or your fund net position that's been invested in your capital assets. And then the rest would be unrestricted or to use for your, your own, um, your, what you're in business to do for your purposes. So then the, on the next page, we have the, um, your statement of revenue expenses and changes in that fund net position or your profit and loss income statement. Again, you can see you've recognized quite a bit of grant income you know, through the work that you've done, whether it's purchasing materials, um, that work in progress that we saw on the balance sheet, 7.4 million. And then we have some operating expenses. So again, you're just starting up. This is an influx of cash from this grant money. So you would expect to see a big increase in fund net position or net income for this year. It's hard to look at a set of financials without any comparison. So next year, this is going to be a lot more meaningful to look at when you have comparative results and see how you're trending as you start to build up your network. Go ahead, Kelly. Cash flows, you know, this we don't have to spend time on this. If anybody really gets excited about cash flows, I'm happy to talk about that offline. Uh, keep going through this. Then we get into the notes to the financial statements. I know many of you may not make it this far. I know it's a lot that we end up giving you, right? But the notes are really helpful to orient you to the financials. So, you know, note one is important because this really describes you as an organization. So if there's other things that you wanted to add here, just let us know. Note two are all of those significant accounting policies that feed into your financials. So in some cases, there are options, right? You want to know how you're, you're classifying operating versus non-operating or how you're dealing with cash and cash equivalents. So this is going to be good information for you to read through and understand um, related to the financials. I'm not going to go through all of them. So the note two goes on for a couple of pages. Again, informative, talks about the new lease pronouncement. All of this is good for you to read on your own. Um, then we get into some more of the footnotes that are required. So if you keep going to the next, yep. So concentration of credit risk. This is something that um, looks at your cash in your financial institutions. You know, those are secured up to 250,000. Based on the timing of these deposits, right? At a Again, at a point in time, you had this much at risk um, based on your banking relationships. And also the concentration of revenue at this point in time, all of that revenue is coming from the pass through state and federal government programs. For commitments, this is an area that um, we had had some revisions and refinement through the review of the draft to just really lay out what these commitments are. So this, the commitments are things that as an organization, you have these future commitments and liabilities that it's informative to the reader to understand when these are coming due. Doesn't mean that they're in the financials as a liability, but something that is a commitment that's going to come in some cases spanning over three years. And I'm sure you're, this group is more familiar with all of these agreements than even we are. So that's what those have to do with. Um, note six describes the leases, as I mentioned, that now have to be brought onto the balance sheet. This talks through the terms of the leases, um, what those values are, and how we've we've determined the amount that's capitalized on the balance sheet. A lot of calculations. This was not a fun one to implement, but uh, it is here nonetheless, so you can read through that. This is showing how that um, those lease liabilities are going to amortize or be reduced on your balance sheet over time. And then note seven is subsequent events. Again, this is a is something that's largely up to you. If there are uh, significant events that happen after the end of the year, these tend to be really significant. We tend to be vague. You know, if there's a a, a large donation, if there's a large grant, if there is a you know have a, you have an arm of your business that closes, it's really large items that we want to address through this. And we didn't have anything that we felt rose to that occasion. Then we have um, under your reporting, governmental reporting, we must report budget versus actual. So we're looking at um, your original budget versus the budgetary actual amounts and looking at some of those differences. It's really hard first year, right? Knowing what this was going to look like. Most of the time it's on a cash uh, cash flow basis. So it's really not accounting for accruals and when you recognize that revenue. So these variances between budget and actual are pretty common. I think what we want to look 
to going forward is when you start to get more consistent results year over year, how those budgets are built and making sure that those are, are as close to reality as possible. This is just more of that of that budget. And then we get into this is where we start the single audit or the compliance audit for your grants. Um, you know, I'll mention this. I know Callie's going to go through some of the specific findings, but what this schedule is is really the driver for all of the single audit work. It's called a Schedule of Expenditures of Federal Awards, or CFA, is what you'll often re hear it referred to as. This categorizes all of the federal pass-through money that we have to evaluate as part of our single audit. So you had some very a very large grant, that first one there, that's almost $6 million, but you also had some other coronavirus relief funds that came through. So we have to make sure we're accounting for all of those on this schedule. And really this is something that in the future is something that management provides to us that we actually audit um, and make sure that everything's included. And so from these, this is what we use the criteria for these grants to determine our major programs and what we have to test to be compliant with the single audit. This is some some footnotes that relate specifically to the CFA. So then we get into, you know, some of the findings and, you know, Callie, do you want to talk about these a little bit? Yep, sorry. My mouse is being a little funky right now. <laughs> sure. So in Jerry's email, he mentioned um, the findings that we um, that we had during the single audit. Um, and if you, if I'm just going to scroll to um, these these three here. So um, as he mentioned, we had two material weakness um, findings and a um, significant deficiency finding over um, in internal controls over compliance. So um, the first one was had to do with reporting. Um, so we found during our testing that reports, progress reports that were submitted to the state um, did not tie to what we received, um, tied to the general ledger that we received during um, our audit. So we were provided backup um, for these reports that were submitted to the state. So we could see that at the time that the reports were run, um, it did match what was in the general ledger. Uh, so this led us to believe that changes were made in QuickBooks after these reports were submitted to the state. Um, so usually we do recommend that backup is kept uh, with these reports that are being submitted. So it's great that that's already being done. Um, just a little bit of additional recommendation around this area would be uh, that these um, year-end and month-end uh, reconciliations are done um, more timely so that you really do get all of those um, expenses in the appropriate period. Um, what, so that way you don't have to go back and resubmit to the state uh, a different report afterwards. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of information here that relates to this one finding, right? And this is a very specific way that the single audit needs it to be reported. What's nice about these is you have an opportunity to respond to these comments and say what you're doing is corrective action. And I think it's it is not it's very common to have a finding in these single audits. What they're looking for is that there's a remedy in place, that you don't have the same finding year after year after year that you're making these adjustments. And these are, are fairly minor adjustments, right? I think we were looking at this is just um, making sure you're within the, the compliance period for claiming those those expenses. And I think this is something that's easy, easily correctable, but something we left these highlights because we threw in some words, but these should really be yours if you wanted mm -hmm. to expand on that. Um, the next one we were we were looking at uh, had to do with period of performance. Uh, so each grant um, has its own period of performance. So um, when we were reviewing the agreements, we found that one of the uh, one of the grants uh, award period ended for June 30th, 2022. Um, and then during testing, we found that some expenditures were being charged to this grant uh, after June. Um, so because of this, uh, the district had to go back and um, resubmit reports to the state uh, to show um, the updated expenditures uh, charged to each grant. 
Um, so in, in this, we just recommend that period of performance kind of be at the top of, of people's minds, um, that that's really noted for each grant. And then each month, maybe go through uh, the expenditures that were charged to each grant and just make sure that they're staying within that period of performance for each grant. And luckily for this one, we had, there was some room to sort of reallocate some of those expenses, right? This was the right. circumstance that we went back right. and, and said, because and, it's, when we're looking at findings, the fact that it was out, whether it was expenses that didn't, were not qualified to be in the grant is different than if it's just a period of performance. So if we mm -hmm. could adjust that and lessen the comment, that's kind of what we did. So I think these are, are pretty easy to rectify and should not be a red flag to anybody who's reading. Right. Uh, and be, and because you received so many different grants uh, that were all under the same federal program, it, it made it really easy to um, kind of exchange expenses that, that did ended up falling in um, before that June 30th grant end period. So again, just like Kelly said, there's we have the highlighted um, uh, waiting for you if you want to add anything to, to these uh, corrective actions. Um, then the, the third finding we had was a significant deficiency, which um, Jerry mentioned in his email is a little less severe than the material weakness, but still uh, warrants, you know, some attention to it. Um, so for, for salaries that are allocated to um, federal funds, uh, the, the government requires that they um, have some sort of tracking. So um, this, this usually is a time and effort documentation for uh, salaries allocated to these federal grants. So um, when we were testing, we found that there wasn't really any um, documentation uh, showing time and effort for, for the salaries. Um, and this this is a really, um, we see this often, it, it's a really easy fix. I think that there's a couple of options that we usually recommend. Um, the first would be the timesheets. Um, it's an easy way to, to get this. Um, time and effort documentation, just simply each week, you know, 10 hours to one grant, 30 hours to another grant, employee signs it, and then it's approved. Um, so that's a really common um, way to keep track. Uh, another way that we would suggest that would work well for the district, um, because the uh, salaries are charged specifically to one grant rather than among other grants. Um, so since all of it is charged to one grant, it would be easy to also just do a time and effort certificate. Uh, so this could be done just every six months. Um, and I sent Bonnie um, kind of an example, but I can send it to others as well, uh, of just a guideline to follow. But but in reality, it's really just so that the employee can certify um, that the hours charged were for a specific grant, and then somebody approves that. And again, that's common because you don't often think of that for salaried employees, right? That you're doing time cards and that sort of stuff. So it's a very common finding that we see, but an easy, easy fix too. Mm -hmm. right. So those were the, the findings related to the compliance audit. Before, there is also a, a, a finding related to financial statement preparation. I think was the keep going, yes, here. So this is having to do with your overall reporting. So the requirement here is that you are able to prepare fully compliant gap financial statements with all the footnotes and everything that goes with it, all the fix-ins, right? We have a hard time doing that sometimes. It's a very hard threshold to meet. I, I think when we look at your the limited number of people that are involved, I think that you know, our primary focus was on that preparation of the financial statements. But Callie, was there anything else from an internal control perspective that we wanted to suggest be improved or that we should talk about further? Yeah, um, I think that while we were doing the audit, we found um, that the bank statements were uh, ending on the 20th of each month. Um, and I think we discussed this, but this is just kind of a an easy fix um, to make them more in line with month end and then year end. Um, so it's easier to reconcile uh, to, to year end than it was this year. And then we also, um, because the uh, Bonnie is the outsourced uh, CPA um, and she really does most of the transactions, if not all, um, we, we kind of wanted to just discuss um, 
the other people that are reviewing her work, um, kind of looking at the accounts uh, and, and just making sure that everybody understands what, what's going in each account, what's coming out, the, you know, the ins and outs of, um, of what she's doing, kind of. It's that oversight, right, to make sure that, you know, if if somebody has complete control over one part of the the system, that there's another set of eyes, you know, that somebody else is reviewing the the actual bank statement itself, the reconciliations. Usually we're still seeing a lot of most of the risk happening around cash in and out. And you have a lot of cash, right? So I think it's it's making sure that you're not complacent with um, having this third party do it. There still should be some oversight related to that. And it's hard. Well, and it's Kelly, hard. if I if I may, we uh, we we are in the middle of changing the way we get reporting from Bonnie. Um, in that we 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 want our coding and our invoices that we're paying be aligned with our budget line items, so that we're we're tracking our 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 invoices to our budget. Uh, on a on a line item basis on a monthly basis so that it's I think it'll be a lot more clear as to where the money's going and of course the money coming in right now is pretty straightforward uh, that 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 that's not the fuzzy part it's the it's it's where it's going and keeping track of what types of things our funds are being spent on and aligning that with our budget so we're we're making that transformation right now um, with Bonnie and and Janiel and and Ray are working on that, so I I think that will address the item that you just brought up because that we we recognize that that's that's a, a bit of a gap ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we'll continue. So, you know, as part of our audit, we always look at your systems and controls. You know, what processes you have in place, and we'll always recommend. You know ways to improve that. We don't just look at it this first year. We don't do an audit of it, but we do reperform some of those systems to make sure that they're functioning the way that they're designed. So I think, you know, it'll be something that you that grows with you as you grow and you expand your your team and who gets involved with that. But I think if you have good controls over, you know, the the cash payments out and the money coming in, then that's going to be the the focus there that will help you the most. Thank you. Uh, yep. Does anyone have a question for Kelly or Callie? And I will forward the. Uh, did did you um, remind me, Kelly? Please, did you send the presentation to the governing board, or was that just to a, a short list of us? So I sent the updated version, but it didn't seem to go through with the link. I think it only made its way through to you. The that it didn't let me send to the board um, outlook group. So I think you'll have to forward that one along. Not and what a we can do is send you the PowerPoint that we mentioned that has sort of the the wraparound of what our responsibilities are, your responsibilities, a good sort of partner document to this audit. Uh, and, and I have that. So I can I can send both bits out. I had sent the draft out early in the in the earlier in the day, the previous draft. I wasn't sure where we'd be um, in preparation for the meeting. And I did want folks to have the opportunity to have something to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yep. And uh, anything else, Kelly, Cla Kelly, any closing remarks you'd like to make or otherwise I think we'll say thank you so much. Well real quick I just wanted to mention you know what happens from here I know this is your first one so we will you know wait for your final approval if there's any other edits we've we've incorporated all of them that you've provided so far um, once we do that there's a representation letter that comes to us to release the report but because you have a single audit there's one more step and that is submitting that to the federal clearinghouse. So that has to be done within um, 60 days, 30 days of when we issue, but shortly after. And so Callie can help you with that process if you have any any issues with that. She's done that for many of our clients, but I just wanna say that to all of you because that is a, a different thing for a single audit that you have to make sure you apply with at the end. And, and we certainly will wanna do that. So we, <laughs> we, we will comply. We will remind you too. So. <laughs> okay, Ray, I see your hand is up. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, just one other thing, and that is that uh, by statute, we're required to send the final audit 
to each of our town members, legislative bodies. So, so all the select boards, city councils, whatever, uh, they will they will get a copy of this. That's right. Not a, not a, not a problem there. We will. Uh, we're a transparent organization to the extent that we can be. And as you saw here, Kelly, in our public meeting, where uh, you get to see how the sausage is made or not, <laughs> as the case <laughs> well, may be. I think you guys should be proud of your first year getting through this audit. I think it's a good outcome um, and I appreciate all everyone's help. I know that it's not easy to do this for the first time through and appreciate all of your assistance and patience. Well, thank you, thank you both. And we very much appreciate the work you've done with us. It's been a pleasure working with you. So thank, thank you. you. Thank and you and we'll be in touch. Sounds Go good. have a good dinner, thank please. <laughs> Sounds good, I will do that. Have a good one. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you all. All right, so let's see. We uh, we had uh, left in a bit of a mess there <laughs> with uh, with 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 uh, motions and motions nested within motions. Um, I've been taking some notes. Would you like me to recap, Jerry? Well, let me ask another question. Uh, should we continue this now, or is this an issue that really needs further refinement, you know, back at committee? And I'm just asking that for the, for the, see nodding heads. I don't see really nodding heads. I, I have a hand up for Maggie. Go ahead, Maggie. With all I think we need to revise this, but. Um, I, I think that a decision should be made this evening um, because funding, or I'm sorry, pricing has to be approved by this body, and we are getting closer and closer to having live customers, and the website needs to show that so that they can pick the packages that they want. So as painful as this may be for each of you this evening, and I'm super glad I don't have to vote, um, I really recommend that you make a decision this evening. Okay, point taken. Let's go to Siobhan and then Linda. I just wanted to add that it sounds like the committee has a difference of opinion here and that that's why it's coming to the board in the manner at which it says come. Uh, I, well, Ray is shaking his head, Linda's nodding, so... Yeah, no, that's, I, a good, I, that's a good insight. Yeah, <laughs> so I don't think sending it back to committee is going to be helpful. Uh, um, but I agree with Maggie that we should make a decision sooner rather than later. So let's have the discussion now. Okay, I'm going to go to Linda. But first, let me remind folks that, that, that what's being brought forth now was passed unanimously at the executive committee just last week. But go ahead, Linda, please, and then we'll go to Ray. We don't have enough research on commercial businesses. We uh, didn't get enough research done from uh, Crawford. I think we need to go back and get more research on pricing and special benefits that they get for those prices. I don't think we should vote for commercial. I think we should put up residentials with their add-ons and packages right now. I looked into our pre-subscriptions and there's only one customer in CLO1 interested in commercial. So we have time to get it right and get some more research on commercial businesses, pricing and what really attracts uh, commercial businesses to take higher speeds. Uh, uh Understood. I don't expect that we're going to have a lot of commercial customers relative to residential customers. And we 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 right started. Now. Pardon me. There's only one right now that's interested in commercial in CLO one. And 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 we started out with the notion that they would all be individually worked through, and it was a, you know. Uh, re re you know, request a discussion. I forget the term that we used, you know, re uh, inquire. request, inquire. So they were inquire, and then we moved to come up with these specific numbers. Uh, we don't, have, we don't uh, have characteristics on the criteria for 
when someone comes to inquire. We really don't have the yeah, criteria and, and to make sure a decision. I'm not sure that we ever will because there's so few that your, your sample is going to be so small that the average other is, people, isn't going to Jerry, be. Jerry, other companies have gotten commercial packages. We need to do more research. I'm done. Okay, doc. Uh, Chuck, your hand was up and then down. I'm not sure where you are on that. Uh, the conversation got to what I wanted to get to. So okay, very good. Um, um, and, and just you know, just to remind, we have Linda's motion to amend Ray's amendment on the floor that we need to address before we go back to Ray's motion. In, in indeed, and I'm going to let Jeremy Matt read his notes. Let's have Maggie. <laughs> Close this out, and then we'll have Jeremy read read his notes to set this so we know what we're voting on here. Go ahead, Maggie. As the individual that would be responsible for doing the marketing research, for the first time since I've come on board, I'm going to agree with Crawford. They did less marketing research on businesses because they're is less availability, as mentioned, to do marketing research on businesses. Um, so we're going to use a little common sense here. And any town that you live in, in Vermont, if you look around, there's a reason that we have small mom and pop shops. We don't allow big box stores here in a lot of our towns. And so in our rural areas, they are going to be smaller businesses. We're going to have that Ben and Jerry's that needs the big giant internet package, but that's the exception to the rule. There's absolutely zero reason why we cannot vote on this this evening because the information that I'm going to bring back to you in a couple of months is truly not going to make a difference. I, I promise. Okay, thank you. Jeremy, can you tell us what we're voting on here, sir? Uh, yeah, so the original motion made by Ray was move that the governing board approve commercial rates of 179 per month for service of one gig and 259 per month for service of two gig. Um, Linda then made the motion to remove the one gig service level from that motion. So the new motion uh, as amended would read move that the governing board approve a commercial rate of $259 per month for service of one gig. Okay. Two gig. Two gig. $259 a month for a service of one gig? Is that what I'm you said? I'm sorry. I am reading wrong. It's two gig. Thank you for the correction. Yes. And that's what I have written down in my notes. I just read it wrong because I'm tired. Okay. And have both of those motions been seconded? Uh, yes. I seconded Ray's and Chuck sent it, seconded Linda's. Okay. So which motion are we voting on now? Linda's, Linda's. motion to have just two gigs for 259. Is that what we're voting on? So, Jerry, technically what we're voting on here is a motion to amend the motion the motion made by Ray. So what we're voting on is whether or not we want to accept Linda's mo uh, change to the motion to the floor, which kind of overrides Ray's original motion, if approved. And then we vote again on whether we uh, uh, approve the original motion if it doesn't pass, or the emotion as amended, if it does pass. Okay, so let's let's vote now on on Linda's motion to amend, if that's the appropriate way to say it. Um, I think we've had enough discussion. Are there any opposed to Linda's motion to amend? Opposed. I see three okay, so opposed. In that case, we need to, well, we need to do a roll call vote, Jerry. Um, if you don't mind holding on a sec while I get set up for that. Okay, go ahead, sir. Uh, let's see. Uh, I should have seen this coming. My apologies, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we can probably just raise our hands. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go through. I'll do a roll call because I I need to get every, I need to make sure that we've got all that we hit all of the governing board people and that I accurately record the votes. And we've got some people who are here who are alternates, but who are voting members. Um, so if you just bear yeah, one one me, vote per town. One vote for town, correct. Um, like for example. <laughs> Jared and Seth are both alternates, but I do not believe that either of their primaries are here, so they are both voting members. Yes, that's correct. The primary for Cabot's not here tonight. All right. Um, so are we ready to vote on this? Go ahead, Jeremy. All right. So, uh, Alan. No. Uh, Sorry, who did you just call? Javon. Me? That's not alphabetical. No, it's not. <laughs> oh my God, I, I, was, I wasn't ready. Abstain, <laughs> I'm abstaining. <laughs> Henry. No. I'd like to know the urgency for why we have to get the commercial rates out when there's no demand. I don't believe there can be any discussion while we're in the middle of a vote. Yeah, the vote the vote was no. Uh, so Jeremy, Matt, I am also going to vote no on that. Linda? Yes. John Morris? No. Uh Chuck. No. Uh Tom. Abstain. Um RD. Oh, RD is not here. I apologize. I copied him. Uh, Jerry. You said Jared or Jerry? Jerry Diamantides. Oh, no. Sorry, Star Starlink is doing its best for us here. <laughs> All right. Uh, Tim Sullivan. Tim, you're on mute, sir. I don't think he's here. No, he's I don't see here. him in the list did anymore. He, oh, did he drop oh. off it? Okay. I think so. Oh, yeah, okay, so he did. Um, so I will put him down as not present. Um, Michael Gray. No. Ray Pelletier. No. Uh, Jared Thomas. Uh, no. And Seth O'Brien. No. All right. I mean, it doesn't. Yeah. Okay. So uh, motion does not pass. Okay. Then we can go to the original motion. Uh, by Ray, and I believe seconded by Siobhan at that point, but Jeremy, Matt, you have that. Oh, Chuck, go ahead, please correct me. I, I'm sure I need it. I, I think you have that right, but um, Henry had his hand up first, but I do have a comment, so if you could get back to me after Henry, please. Oh, sure. Jeremy I didn't realize seconded Henry had it. His hand up. Go ahead, Henry, sir. It was just my comment about the urgency of establishing commercial rates um, with when we don't have a demand for it. Um, I don't know that there's urgency as much as it leaves a hole in our in our presentation. And if there are commercial folks out there, they they will want to see some opportunity. Uh, Chuck, go ahead. You're next, and then Ray. One possibility, just to float it, is right now. Because uh, again, if you you see in chat um, in CLO one, the case is so far 0.78 percent of people coming through indicated interest in commercial. One out of 128 total, um, and and so in the interest of getting CLO one up and running, we can remove the drop down that has you select from residential commercial, assume residential for now, and 
be on our way and revisit you know the actual pricing we want to put live when we want to put it live um and uh the second thing i will say is i intend to vote no on the motion as it stands i i just i don't i don't think we have thought through what the differentiated product here that you are getting is uh based on paying this much more money per month and uh, you know uh, I, I think we need to have a better stance on what you're getting for that additional money before we decide how to price it. I'll stop there. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, Maggie, I see that your hand up was up before raise. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. I'm going to um, go with Chuck on this. However, I feel that the pricing of commercial should be a conversation that happens between um, the communications committee and is then brought to the executive committee from the communications committee and then to you. Uh, and I know that um, <laughs> Siobhan brought up a very good point and there's a little difference of opinion happening um, within the ranks there. But I, I feel that Chuck is on point that we, if we are going to make changes and we're not gonna, you are not gonna vote on commercial this evening, then that's where it needs to go back to the drawing board uh, and let Chuck spearhead that conversation. So be before I before I call on Ray here, our, our our rates for residential, especially because we are, as Chuck has noted, predominantly residential, are driven by the costs of doing business. And we've we've developed our rates through the finance committee, not through the communications committee. Um, now, it may be the case that commercial being such a different animal is is handled differently there. But really, our our rates come out of the finance committee because our rates are totally driven by cost um, and and anticipated take rates, and that that's all the purview of of the planning and finance uh, committees. But I'm going to go to Ray now and Siobhan, please. Um, we truly don't know what the demand is. We don't know what the demand is. We've, we haven't sent out any flyers or notices or anything to create demand. And so just uh, saying that one person out of 100 has indicated they want a commercial doesn't reflect what demand might be. Executive Committee has made this recommendation. Um, the Finance Committee has driven these prices for the reason that we need it to support our business. We have an ARPU of average revenue per user of $92 that we're trying to hit. And this will help us toward achieving that revenue with regard to what um, additional services the uh, commercials get. Uh, they have their separate business line for a service. If something happens to them, they go to the head of the line. They're not, they're not picked up by the same people that are answering the residential because businesses and jobs and services, they're dependent upon them having their internet up. So uh, I'm supporting the original motion that was uh, that was also recommended by the executive committee. I'm gonna go to Siobhan and after Siobhan, I don't see any more hands up. So if there's no um, response to Siobhan, we'll go to a vote after what Siobhan has to say. Go ahead, please, Siobhan. I did actually bring this up during the executive committee, the same that Chuck did. If I were a small business and you were going to offer me a phone, a separate phone line for service, but were offering me stable service that I wouldn't be using, I'm paying you 60 bucks a month for a service I'm not going to use. As a small business owner in this in this area, I would really not be keen on that. I would go for I would just go for the 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 cheaper rate. I, I feel like business accounts 
if I'm going to be paying $60 a month more, I want more than just a dedicated support line when you're telling me that my business is going to be fine because my internet's going to be stable. Um, I, I think that's my only point. I'm done. Thank, thank you. Uh, Jared and then Jeremy. Uh, just a couple of brief comments. Um, as a nature of my job, I actually deal with a lot of small businesses in the area, um, and there is significant demand for better internet service. Um, and the uh, offering uh, priority support and issue resolution is absolutely critical of that. Thank you, sir. Uh, Jeremy, go ahead. I mean, I, there's nothing in, in any of our rates or terms of service that I'm aware of that prevents people from operating small business on our residential tier of service if they're willing to accept that. Um, so, I mean, I don't have any problem with saying, if you want to get to the head of the line for customer service, it's going to cost you an extra X amount per month. If you don't want that, go with residential. We're fine with that. Um, that's my two cents. Alan, sir, go ahead. Uh, this is a question from Maggie. I just want to be absolutely sure I understand what Maggie uh, has said. Uh, recently, Maggie, you're you're suggesting that we should delay the vote. We should vote this down uh, tonight and take more time to come up with uh, more more consideration and more information before we take this up again. Is that correct? Actually, no. Um, my preference would be that this be voted on this evening because I feel that we have enough market research. And there is enough demand by small businesses, just as Ray pointed out, we don't know out of the 128 people that have signed up residential and there's only one that is a business, that is because I haven't started pounding the pavement yet because we haven't had enough construction in and I've been holding back. But we all know there are small businesses out there and they need internet and they're going to be very happy to see us coming. So I feel we can vote on this. I feel that um, we're not going to get better market research than what Crawford provided. And if you all are, are happy with the way the price scaling is, that you might as well just be done with it. If you are not going to vote tonight, my recommendation is that it be sent to the communications committee for reconsideration. Okay, thanks. I, I usually like to accept the recommendations of paid professional staff, so I, I think I'll vote yes for this. So I have Jared and Alan have residual hands up, and I see that Linda has her hand up. Go ahead, Linda. So I have a question for Maggie also. Maggie, do you think that we should put up the prices on all the commercials and not just the bottom two? No, I do not. Um, when you're talking about that um, higher tier, we're getting into some larger businesses and there is a huge scale with those larger businesses. Um, you know. Ben and Jerry's versus a large warehouse that has quite a few accountants and whatnot on is, is completely different. And so we need to be able to price that per business. Uh, I, I feel it's perfectly fine to say, please let us come out and, and give you a quote. Um, that sounds professional to me. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, I, I think we've had some fairly thorough discussion here. We have a motion. We have a second. I would like I would like to to take a vote. Are there any opposed to the motion? Yes. I see Linda and Chuck opposed. Are there any other opposed? I think we need to do a roll call, Jerry. Okay, do it, because Jeremy. There are people there. I, I, I mean, I think correct That's me if fine. I'm wrong, Alan, but I think we need that, to do 
That's roll fine. Go ahead. Um, yeah, you and you have to actually report the uh, roll call vote in the uh, minutes. Yeah, I I do that. I make a little table, um, and I'm taking Good, and thanks. I'm writing those down on a on a yeah. text sheet right now. Great. Um, so uh, here we go. Uh, Alan Gilbert. Yes. Uh, Siobhan Paracone. Abstain. Uh, Henry Amistadi. Abstain. Uh, Jeremy, Matt, I will vote uh, yes. Linda, Ravel. No. Uh, John Morris. Yes. Chuck Burt. No. Tom Fisher. No. Uh, Jerry Diamantides. Yes. Uh, Michael Gray. Uh, yes. Ray Pelletier. Yes. Uh, Jared Thomas. Yes. Uh, Seth O'Brien. Yes. <laughs> All right, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Voting yes. Mm -hmm. One, two, three against and two abstaining, so the motion passes. All right. Well, thank you very much all for quite a rich discussion. Uh, Jeremy, your hand is up. Yeah, I had a question for Maggie. Um, Maggie, I, I believe I remember you saying at the beginning of this discussion that you thought that having um, residential prices ending in nine might be might, might make cv fiber seem untrustworthy is that a correct remembrance on my part yes that's been my stance um since we had uh one of our first tests uh with the um website that was one of the comments made multiple times by the testers that they would prefer to see even numbers and we took that okay. to committee and it wasn't supported. In that case, I would like to make a motion um, as follows. So, uh, whereas our community relations manager has shared a professional opinion that having prices ending in nine may make CV fiber seem untrustworthy. And whereas we have hired a community relations manager to advise the governing board on marketing and public relations matters, move that we revise all of our rates for both residential and commercial service uh, to maintain our current ARPU approximately, uh, and the add-on prices to have round numbers ending in zero or five, um, as recommended by the communication, or by our community, community relations manager. Second. Second. I heard Chuck first. Of course you did. Okay, right, so <laughs> Ray, Although you so have I your. I should let Jerry. <laughs> you you have yeah. your, no, that's that's fine. Ray, you have your hand up, sir. Yeah. Uh, point of order. I think the motion has uh, um, not been warned. It's out of order, and if that none of that uh, uh, resonates with Alan, uh, I recommend that we table it. I move that we table it. So move that it's, uh, first of all, out of order. And we have a lot of things to do in this agenda. And going back and re recycling all of our uh, r rates, which have been previously approved, uh, takes a lot more consideration than what we're going to give it here. So let me let me ask the parliamentary question to Alan. Uh, this has this issue um, has not been specifically warned. Are are we are we outside of bounds here with this motion as presented by Jeremy? I think so because it hasn't been warned. The way that this could have been done and would have worked is if this would have been attached as an amendment to the motion we just passed. 
<clears throat> but since that wasn't done, we now have a new item that is um, arguably not coming out of nowhere. I mean, there was some discussion about it, <clears throat> but I think <clears throat> to be technically really safe, it should be warned as a separate item for the next meeting. Okay, thank you. There are a number of hands popping up. Man, personally, I really don't want to go the, down the nine or zero rabbit hole again, but here we go. Maggie, go ahead. You're number one, and then Chuck, and then Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, I really appreciate your vote of confidence, and I agree. I really don't want to have this fight again. I don't think that it should be a fight. Um, my recommendation, since this is not going to be able to be voted on tonight, I really would love to see everyone that has an opinion about this and the next um, meeting that this can be warned, whether it's the financial committee meeting or um, with the executive committee or with this body, but I feel that this needs to be taken care of very quickly because we want to put our rates up and we want people to be able to start signing up. So not being able to get this resolved this evening is, is very unpleasant. Uh, understood, let, let me correct you there, Maggie, our rates are up and have been up for a couple of months with the nines. Uh, Chuck, you're next. I would like to call out that what we warned was an agenda item of services, fees, and affordability. I do not think the motion on the table is remotely out of order because we do not warn the details of what we're going into. And we regularly take on multiple motions per item, agenda item. And so I think it's perfectly within the purview of the warned agenda item to tackle the motion that is on the floor. Um, that said, I also and, respect Ray's um, viewpoint that there a lot of thought went into the pricing as designed. We could certainly take the stance of, okay, we just bump it up a dollar each and then we're, we've got a nice round number, but like that also seems kind of like a half-baked way to do anything. And so uh, it's sort of in line with what Maggie suggested. I think if we believe this is important, it would make sense for the finance committee to take it as a, a serious agenda item and come back to the board with with a, an approval. Um, and hopefully, you know, if there were a large degree of sentiment to this effect, the uh, finance committee would take it seriously and 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 action on it. And and okay. Very, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Much appreciated. Jeremy, go ahead, sir, and then we can go back to Maggie. Um, Chuck kind of made my point, but I also wanted to add that the action item for this is listed as uh, action expected. Um, so I, I also do not believe that it's out of order. Okay. Uh, Maggie, back to you, please. I am aware uh, that Janelle, the price maybe. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. If I if I jumped in front of somebody, I can wait. No, it's. I just saw Janelle's hand has number one on it. Oh, I do see that. Th thank you, Jeremy. I hadn't seen that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Maggie, if you don't mind, let's let Janelle have a have a shot at it here. A couple things. The point about uh, raising our numbers to zero is about trust, and we've already put prices up online. Um, so question that. Um, also question whether most people have even seen the prices. And so I think we need to weigh whether whether uh, we have actually established prices um, or not, because we have them up online, but nobody has, uh, we've already voted on them and we've put them online, but nobody has actually signed up for the service. So changing to zero versus keeping the nine, I think we need to weigh that. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying vote one way or another. I'm just saying that if the point is trust, we need to weigh what is the most trustworthy action here. So the, ask that question. And then the other point I wanted to make is I agree that this motion is not out of order because it was warned very broadly and action expected. Okay, um, so let me think where I am here. We have Maggie, Ray, and Linda uh, in that order, please. I completely agree that 
it is on the website and we certainly do not want to break any trust whether anyone has had the opportunity to sign up yet if they've seen it that is a trust issue but at no point in time if i ever said round up we can certainly go down to the 99 without messing up our financials because we have not yet listed our commercial pricing that was the whole discussion of this evening so very easily we can make up what we might miss out on by rounding and it doesn't even have to be 99 it, it could be 50 cents for all i care it just can't be 99 because as jeremy said in chat earlier it's like a late night infomercial and and we're losing trust there so there's a way to balance this very easily even voting this evening without losing funds for this organization i truly believe that okay wow so this is this is a far deeper conversation than was anticipated by the folks that signed into this this meeting today and going back to CLO1, where the percentage that was identified as commercial, if you, if, if you, if you knock $5 or $4 or what, to get to zero, whatever it is, if knocking them down, you're not going to make it up with a half of a percent of a commercial uh, person in CLO1 anyway. So I, it, sound, it really sounds to me like we're not quite prepared sure. to fully revisit sure. this this discussion tonight. Um, but I will continue down the list as folks still have their hands raised. Uh, so Ray, Linda, and Tom Fisher, please. Yeah, I'd really like to move on to action items that we have later in the agenda. <clears throat> um, we've published it online. We put it out in front porch forum. We've said it in webinars. The governing board voted for it. We're done. Linda, yours, please. I think there's a right to have a, a vote on this tonight. Uh, we also have action items on add-ons for residential um, that we haven't dealt with yet. Is that no. right? No. No, the Janille? executive committee took it. I'm executive asking Janiel. It was executive committees for the add-ons. The the for the purview of uh, governing board is commercial rates. So they have the purview to do make the decisions on add-ons, and the governing board does not. Is that right? The executive committee approved the add-ons, and the governing board will approve or do what it will with the uh, commercial rates. Right. So I still think we should, board already... we, should, we should take a vote on this uh, um, Jeremy's motion. Tom Fisher, go ahead, sir. I uh, I'm happily in agreement with everybody here. Um, <laughs> but I would uh, point out that no matter what rates we choose, they are going to be wrong. Um, we are not on our first year with no experience going to correctly price our services for the people we are going to get. Let me just state that as a flat out certainty. Um, we are going to be revisiting this. We are hopefully, I'm thinking on an annual basis, revising our rates for probably the first couple of years at least. Um, there is a lot of work that still needs to be done. And I don't think we need to get too deep into the quagmire here um, when we still have a long ways to go on where we're going to get on this. So I am going to be voting against the idea that we should be changing uh, any rates at this point. Um, and we should just be moving on with other business. Thank you. Jeremy, go ahead. Well, I don't see any other hands up. I was just going to say call the question because I think we've all made up our minds and I want to move on as well. Um, OK, help me understand, Jeremy, what is the question? Is the question with, that we are within? I want I want to vote on this. I'm, I think that's the term when yes, you say that you right. want to it's, it's stop yes. discussion. It's not allowed. That's what it's called in our rules. But nevertheless, I think we could still. Uh, move okay. on. I, I apologize. OK. I'm, I'm sorry. There were multiple people talking at one time, and I really didn't understand what anyone said. 
I believe our policy is that we're not allowed to call the question that so long as there is still discussion to be had, we have to continue discussion or table. Um, but at this point, it seems like discussion has ended. So let's move on. So yes, you sir. can call the question because the discussion has come to an end. This call the question means he wants to take a vote. Alan, help me help me with the jargon, please. <laughs> I, I think Tom is. I think Tom is right. In in our rules, we said that we would not call questions. That uh, the debate will, would go on unless uh, people voted to go ahead and uh, do something different. I mean, I, I I think on this one, we can't. We if there's still debate, still if people still want to talk, we have to let people talk. Nope. In other words, I think, I think I don't. I, done. I don't. Well, then, then it's a then it's a, a moot question, and we can go on to the next thing. I'm just saying that Tom is right. I don't think we can use the tool of calling a question. It's it's not allowed by our rules and regulations that we have in our procedures. I know that the way we've been operating is that we've let the discussion play out until the discussion has ended, and then we go to a vote if it's something that is that is up for a vote. Now, we have a motion on the table. Is that correct, Jeremy? Yes. Did we get a second for your motion? We have, yes, yes, Chuck seconded. Ray made a motion that no one seconded to basically drop this or to table it. Um, so I think that we're at a vote, and I suspect that there is disagreement. So I think we should just go straight to roll call. Yep. Uh, what's the motion? Yes. Um, I will reread the motion. So, whereas our community, or should I skip the whereas is basically that we want to trust our community, uh, community relations manager. Uh, so the motion is move that we, we that we revise all of our rates for both residential and commercial services while maintaining our current ARPU approximately. Um, and uh, our prices for add-ons such that they end in round numbers uh, five or zero um, as recommended by the community relations manager. And that was seconded by Chuck. Correct. Okay, let's take a roll call. Okay, are we ready for that? Yes, sir. Okay, Alan Gilbert. No. Ravon Pericone. Come back to me. Henry Amistadi. No. Jeremy Matt, I am going to vote yes. Linda Gravel. Yes. John Morris. No. Chuck Burt. Yes. Uh, oops, uh, let's see, Tom Fisher. No. Uh, Jerry Diamantides. Nope. Michael Gray. I'm going to abstain. Uh, Ray Pelletier. No. Jared Thomas. No. Uh, Seth O'Brien. Yes. And going back to Siobhan. Yes. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, one, two, three, four, five. Yes, one abstain. So the motion does not pass. Okay. Can we move on? Thank you. Um, we are past the time when I thought the meeting would be over. Uh, so if we can possibly expedite what we need to do, that might be helpful. But let's, uh, let's move on. We have a website and marketing update and outlook, please. Who is going to take that? Matt, you want to jump in? Or would you like me to summarize where we are? We'll just let you summarize for all three of us, if that's OK. <laughs> uh, OK, so we are at a point where we are ready to go live with subscriptions on our website. 
Um, we, there were pending details, obviously, coming out of this meeting uh, around exactly how we were going to go live, but those are now quite clear. We just need to go apply the changes, um, and we will be going to uh, communications committee to approve uh, the go live on those next week uh, and anticipation of going live in about two-ish weeks. Um, maybe a little ahead of that because I think we're we're aiming to get an email campaign out to CLO one around that two week time horizon. So so perhaps a little ahead of that two week time horizon. Um, Linda, Janiel, do you have uh, anything else you'd like to add there? I think your time frame's a little rushed because you don't have we don't have anyone to make the changes, Chuck. The changes are all doable just through the interface. There there are no. Can you do changes. them? I have a son's wedding. Yes, I can do them. Okay. Excellent. Maggie, is there anything you'd like to add? We have the informational brochures that are getting um, design finished right now by John Morris. We'll be going to the printer and we'll be going out to all of our crews and to all of you, if you would like any, we'll be using them at events. And we would like for you to keep some on hand at all times. Uh, and I think that they will be very useful to all of us. Excellent. Uh, thank you. And before I go to Ray, I would like to add that I, I've, I've asked the, uh, the folks that are involved in, the, in this uh, specific issue that we're talking about, to come up with a flow chart that kind of explains the interface between what happens on the construction and the design side and how that moves through and turns into action on the on the marketing and communication side and i've got positive feedback that folks are working on that and my uh, my hope is that there'll be a, a brief discussion about that or an update discussion on that at the next executive committee meeting i think that'll be helpful to inform all of us uh, Ray, your hand is up, sir, please. Yeah, only, only to uh, tell Chuck what I've learned earlier today, and that is that um, Linda's going to be on vacation, I think, from 10 to 14 July. And so if we're going to be testing friendlies with the website, you might need to be available for that if, if those dates are correct. Thank you. Yep, yeah, I saw a nodding head from Chuck. Okay, excellent. Uh, if, if that's it for the website, let's uh, switch gears to the construction update and outlook, please. Uh, Janiel, I'll hand that over to you. Sure. Um, we have we have hung 26 miles of fiber. We are hopeful that we will issue a another notice to proceed to Eustis um, as early as tomorrow, depending on how the rest of this meeting goes. And um, <laughs> we're... <laughs> <laughs> we're looking to we're looking to uh well we just started the laying down of the um of the pad today uh and callus thank you janiel i'm 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 sorry we distracted you in 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 your discussion there L lucas i i know that you're on the line here is there anything else you would like to add to that sir um, I would just add that we're also getting ready to start splicing here in the next hopefully week. Um, right now we're, we are uh, reviewing all the documentation and getting everybody mobilized. So uh, should be more to come on that hopefully in the very near future. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, did did they actually, they didn't pour cement today, did they? Yeah. They did actually, yeah. They did. Wow. Okay. Somehow, I don't know how to get through the rain, but they somehow did it, yeah. Yeah, it was pretty messy out there today. Okay, well, thank you. So uh, let's move on to the next item agenda because this is extremely important. Uh, construction scopes of work and RFP. And I'll take the RFP part because it's purely a notification here for the governing board. Um, we we have new newly found interested parties that would like to do construction work for us. Uh, they did not respond to the original RFP. So we are updating the RFP to, because it's six months old or however old it is. Uh, we've, up, we've updated the RFP and we are reposting 
the RFP in order to uh, in, induce some new interest and get so that we're comparing apples to apples and in all fairness, we're allowing everyone to respond to the same RFP as opposed to doing this in a haphazard way. So we will have a new RFP or a revised RFP that's gonna be on our website. And that's also gonna go up to the, um, the typical suspects that we bring this up to the, 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 uh, the Vermont Clearing House for, for um, uh, municipal uh, contracts, et cetera. Janelle has, has the list in her, in her head. She knows where they go and she's gonna put them up there so that we have doing all of this above board and and you know none of this is uh just a word of mouth type transaction the rfp is re is being reopened for construction um that said um we have some new construction scopes of work that we've been working on that we that we uh ran through the executive committee last week and uh, i'm going to ask that ray i believe you have a motion let's get it out there so we can we can move this. We're in, we're in a good place to get more work done here. Yeah, so um, uh, work is proceeding now with uh, CLO1 and CLO2, and that we need some elbow room uh, for the crews that are being added to the Eustace team. Uh, we're now, we have been running at like two or three crews, and now we're up to eight crews, and we have a great deal of the make ready work. In fact, all of the make ready work done in, um, in the Romney School District. And so this is about 80 miles worth of work. The construction is cost is greater than a million dollars. Uh, therefore, it falls under the board's uh, authority um, to engage, uh, to authorize the engagement of um, a contract with Eustace for this. And so the executive committee has uh, recommends the approval of it. And so I'm going to put a motion in, into the chat room here. Um, and forgive me, for, um, there's no whereas. No applause, please. Um, it is moved that the governing board approve the engagement of Eustace Cabling Enterprises for the Rumney Middle School RSO1 and RSO2 statements of work, subject to the executive committee's authorization of notices to proceed. Second. Um, I have a friendly amendment. It's actually, Jerry, um, according to the motion that was made by the executive committee last week, it would be Jerry to approve the notices to proceed. Yeah, the uh, executive committee has already done that in anticipation of this, so this is fine. Thank you, though. Yes, yeah, you're actually bo you're both right. <laughs> So the, the executive committee has already authorized, pending the approval tonight, has already authorized me to proceed with the notice to proceed um, at my discretion and with Janiel's input, um, because we need to get this going now, because the guys are ready to work and they're out there. Uh, okay, are we ready for a vote then? We have a, a motion by Ray, a second by Jeremy. Let's try this the old fashioned way. Are there any opposed to the motion? Please. Hearing none. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any abstentions? <laughs> Hearing none. The motion passes, and at least we can get the contractors to work. Excellent. Thank you all. Much appreciated. Uh, Chuck, um, I don't know if you saw my email earlier, but I was anticipating that you would carry this. Okay, thank you, sir. Go ahead, please. Yes. Okay, uh, I'm going to go through this as quickly as I possibly can because the whereas is probably do most of the heavy lifting here. But uh, the 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 recent uh, situation on the you know on the board and executive committee and operations committee of a member who was uh, uh, unfortunately uh, not able to serve for a little while has made it abundantly clear that we need to bake in some redundancy as an organization. Um, and there are numerous reasons to do that. Uh, but one of the shortcomings is the structure of the executive committee. So I have a, a motion I've prepared, and it has gone through executive committee as well, uh, to change the charter of the executive committee. Uh, in a moment, I will share the actual text of that change. I'm going to run through the motion really, really quick right now uh, so that we can get through that bit and discuss. So the motion is... Whereas the governing board on 9 March 2021 approved the creation of an executive committee through the approval of an executive committee charter, 
And whereas 30 VSA uh, section 3071 states that members of an executive committee shall be board members, and whereas in the same 9 March 2021 approval, the approved charter states that a membership for quorum and voting purposes shall include the chair, vice chair, committee chairs, and the clerk, if a member of the board, B, the executive director and treasurer will be ex officio non-voting members of the executive committee, as will the clerk, if not a member of the board, and C, the chair of the governing board shall be the chair of the executive committee, and whereas ensuring quorum of all executive committee meetings is critical so that CB Fiber's time-sensitive business can be carried forward quickly and with haste, and whereas having redundancy for individual committee members is critical for preserving continuity of each committee's business, and whereas the executive committee on 6 June 2023 unanimously voted to recommend the following action to the governing board, it is moved that the governing board approve a change to the executive committee charter A, to allow committee vice chairs to serve as alternate members of the executive committee for quorum and voting purposes should the chair of the same committee be unable to attend and so long as the vice chair is also a member of the board and b that the vice chair of the governing board be recognized as the vice chair of the executive committee now how that actually translates in the uh well, in the second. charter itself oh yeah thank you yes May, may I proceed? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just what this actually does way. is it adds these two paragraphs, you know, this that paragraph and this sentence to the executive committee charter, but it's important to understand all the context of why why we need to word it the way we do. And so that's why the whereas is. Uh, but it adds this paragraph that committee vice chairs shall be allowed to serve as alternates in place of a committee chair for quorum and voting purposes when the committee chair for the same committee is unable to serve so long as they are also a member of the board. And then it also adds the vice chair of the governing board shall be the vice chair of the executive committee. Excellent. Thank you, Chuck. That was that was very clear thank you uh i'm going to go to tom and then alan please i don't think it impacts the uh, motion as it is but uh just curious as to how it would be implemented do you think it is uh, critical or, or at least important that the vice individuals uh, attend the executive committee on a regular basis whether or not the primary person is there it, uh, something I've been pointing out that this board, for example, often has just delegates and very few alternates that show up. And so if an alternate does show up on a day that the board member is not available, they may not have any clue what they're doing when they get into it. It is my opinion, yes, but I'll leave it at that. Yes, we, we, that, that is, that is a, a concern, Tom. You're, 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 you're correct about that. Uh, Alan, yours, and then Ray, please. Yeah, this is real simple. Uh, Chuck, you need to have a two after allowed in the first sentence in the first paragraph. I will accept that as a friendly amendment. So, um, Chuck, I I think the intention the in, intention here is that in the absence of the committee chair, the vice chair would serve on the executive committee. And so I'm looking at the language that says is is unable to serve. And I think you had a particular case in mind with well, inability to serve because somebody's been injured in a car accident. Um, I, I think unable to serve, if I can make a friendly amendment, uh, unable to serve uh, should be changed to is absent. Yeah, I, I would accept that. I could accept that as well. Very good. Very good. I think that's that's consistent with the spirit of the of the issue. Tom, go ahead, sir. Just curious if the chair was not present and the vice chair was to take over as chair of the uh, executive committee, would you still be short one person because that vice chair would have already been a member of the executive committee and is now serving a different role than that committee? You're still short one person, if I'm calculating correctly. Is that a problem? I guess is the real question. I, I don't know that it's a problem necessarily. I think you're I think you're correct, but I don't know that it's necessarily a problem. Yeah, I'll, I'll point out we've had a, a number of cases where um, Jerry was off, uh, you know, paying his bills, <laughs> uh, and and Siobhan stepped right in, took right over, and yes, we were down a person, but it it worked quite well. Uh, 
Michael Gray, go ahead, sir. Yeah, so um, if the chair wasn't there and the vice chair was and was officiating the meeting, um, it would be just one less person of the committee. And as long as there was quorum, um, everything would be fine. Concur. Thank you. Yes, uh, that gets to it. If there is an additional discussion, well, Jeremy, go ahead, sir. Oh. I just want to point out that it doesn't give anyone multiple votes. Like if someone is the chair of a committee and the vice chair of another committee, they don't get two votes. They still only count as one person for quorum and all the rest. So we're, we're going to stick with one person, one vote. <laughs> or at least we're going to try. Uh, are we ready to vote on this? Okay, uh, are there any opposed to the motion? Hearing none, any abstentions? All right, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you for working this out, Chuck. It, 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 it fills a, a hole that we didn't realize we had until we had it. Thank you. Uh, Alan, we have I just a... Had a yeah, ahead, I just Alan. had a message. I just had a message on my uh, my screen that said we had five minutes left in this meeting. So can I hurry through this real quickly before this blows up? Sure. I don't know that that actually oh, happens, yeah. but go ahead. OK, I want to point out two things. I'm not in a gulag. If you're looking at the background, my two granddaughters have arrived in the house and I had to go to the furthest be uh, bedroom in the house just so you wouldn't hear all the screaming and yelling. They're having a great time. Second thing is I want to point out how prescient Jerry uh, was when he told me what he thought the avenue for the personnel policy to go through would be. He said, we're not going to have any time to talk about this at the executive committee. And then sure enough, we don't have any time to even talk about a plan that's trying to shorten the amount of time we need to have some action taken on the personnel policy. So instead of my reading a whole bunch of stuff I was going to tell you about the personnel policy, the one that was um, uh, reviewed and endorsed by the policy committee and forwarded to the board for its uh, consideration. Jerry had suggested, and I think it's a good idea, uh, that what we ought to do is you should look at the uh, policy, the proposed policy that was sent out. I sent it out to all uh, governing board members uh, at the end of last week on Friday after the agenda had come out. And if you have any comments whatsoever, about what the policy says, uh, you should get, you should send those comments to me, and then at the next meeting of the executive committee, which will be slightly before the next board meeting, if I have the the, the calendar math right, uh, the executive committee will take up your comments and see if we think those uh, warrant any changes. After that's done, the executive committee will forward on the work it's done and give the proposed policy in whatever form it is at that point to the executive to the governing board for its uh, for its review and approval. Janiel, do you want to throw in anything there cuz you're the one who's really been pulling the policy itself together, but I'm trying to keep this as short as possible. Yeah, I I would just say um this came from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Um, and is a, a personnel policy that applies to all personnel with some specific things that apply only to employees, but it is backed by the state of, of Vermont municipalities. So that's where it was chosen from. So I recommend that folks take a look at this policy and and as as Alan suggested, we'll, we'll work it through. We have two more executive committee meetings before the governing board meets again. So we will have opportunity to discuss and work through that policy. Michael, I see your hands up, sir. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, I just wonder if um, once the uh, final draft of the personnel policy is done, um, do the CE Fiber plan on having a legal review of that? Um, VLCT will uh, offers that service, um, and I would highly recommend it. That is an excellent point. Thank you. That's point taken there. Very helpful, Michael. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, I have to make one more note. I need to yes. have people's comments by noon on Monday the 19th. So essentially six days. 
So any comments, please, written comments to me by noon on Monday, June 19th. Okay. We're, we're, we're really trying to move fast on this, not because we just want to get out of the way, but this is something we've really got to do. It's important now that we have employees working for us that we provide them with the protections that, in some cases, state statutes uh, require of us. So we want to we want to try and get this right and get it in place as soon as possible. I, I concur, Alan. I, be, I believe that's appropriate. Siobhan, I see your hand is up. I just wanted to add, I'm I'm on the policy committee. I've read through this and I support it um, fully. This is, we need to get this out and done. And it was a mistake on our part that it didn't occur to us to do this sooner. And so we need to get this rectified. That's it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. It, ta it takes a village, yes? <laughs> The next, the, the, the next uh, item is a bank authorization that I think has become moot, um, but Ray, go ahead, I'll go to you, but I, 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 Janiel has some updated information on this, I believe. Um, so uh, we need to, this is a technical housekeeping kind of matter that we need to correct some information that's currently being held by our bank um, in, in uh, involving our name and our, and our our EIN, our identification number, as well as the authorized personnel for the bank. And, and um, this is the motion. And um, uh, whereas CB Fibers Bank account with Vescu needs to be updated from its previous name, Central Vermont Internet, and prior EIN to its legal name, CB Fiber, with the current EIN. Whereas authorized users under the account are outdated and need to be updated to the current authorized users of the account, it is moved that Janiel Smith as executive director and Jerry Deeman TDs as governing board chair be recognized as the authorized users of the account with VSQ under the legal name CB Fiber and its current EIN. Second. Second. Janiel, do you want to add to any discussion on this? I, I think this is I think this is the right thing to do. I got correspondence this uh, today from Sam at um, the credit union, and she she just wanted to um, to emphasize that we that the board is uh, is rec recognizes that we need this update and that we have these authorized users on the accounts. Okay, excellent, excellent. I, I had seen that correspondence, but I, w I wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't registering with me. So thank you for that. We have a, a motion, we have a second. I'm not sure that this is going to take additional discussion. Are there any opposed to the motion? Hearing none, are there any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously, thank you. We'll get that all cleared up with our bank account. Um, I'm, I'm looking at my agenda and the next item is adjourn. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all for sticking through it. It's been a it's been a long one.